Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is forest ecologist Nalini Nadkarni, Professor of Biology at the University of Utah. Nadkarni's research interests include community and ecosystem ecology of tropical and temperate forest canopies, the effects of forest fragmentation on biodiversity and community function, and the development of database tools for canopy researchers. In addition, Nadkarni is deeply committed to public engagement with science. She has developed novel ways to share scientific knowledge with a, range, a wide range of public audiences. She actively promotes the partnering of scientists and artists to enhance conservation of forests, and she has created programs to bring science and nature to the incarcerated. Nadkarni is the author of Between Earth and Sky, Our Intimate Connections to Trees, and co-editor of Forest Canopies and Monteverde Ecology and Conservation of a Tropical Cloud Forest. Nadkarni gave a talk, Tapestry Thinking, Weaving the Threads of Humans and Nature, on January 30th, 2019, as the Oregon Humanities Center's Robert D. Clark Lecture. Her talk was part of the Common Good series. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here, thank you so much. So let's um, start with the big question, what led to your interest in forest canopies? How did you become obsessed with the overstory? Well, I, I think I can answer that <laughs> in a very simple way, which was, as a kid, I loved climbing trees. And um, I think that's true of a lot of scientists. You know, if you just scratch the surface of <laughs> a marine biologist or a hydrologist, you'll find that they love the ocean or they loved rivers. And for me, I, I really, my, my desire to help and protect trees came from being able to climb one of the eight maple trees on my parents' driveway felt it was my world, felt it was a place of safety, a place of where I could be myself. And I remember as a, well, I was probably eight or nine years old and, and making this solemn oath to myself that because trees had been so good to me in terms of providing a quiet place in my family life, which was chaotic, five kids, dogs, cats, homework chores, um, I wanted to do something for them. And I, I didn't know about the field of ecology at that point. I only discovered that in college. But so I thought I'd have to be a forest ranger or a park ranger or something. But what I discovered was that actually I could spend my professional life learning about trees and sharing that understanding of trees. Um, and it was it was that impetus of understanding how trees give us stuff, give, gave me stuff mm -hmm. that was important to me. Um, and wanting to provide trees with some of that stuff, wanting to protect and uh, help people understand about them. So one of the things that's interesting about your career is that you sort of came into forest ecology at a time when research of the canopy was only at the very beginning, isn't that right? That's absolutely right. I mean, I, I can tell you that um, my graduate committee of my PhD committee at University of Washington were sort of you know scratching their heads and actually sort of appalled at the idea that <laughs> I wanted to study the forest canopy for my dissertation work. And I remember very distinctly uh, Dr. Dale Cole, who was a you know respected member of my committee, saying, "Well, Nalini, you know there's so many questions on the forest floor. Why do you have to go into the forest canopy to an ask and answer those?" Um, and so they really thought it was sort of Tarzan and Jane stuff, which it looked like, you know, mm -hmm. here we were dangling on ropes from, you know, tropical rainforest trees. But I had a sense somehow that there were important que scientific questions to be asked and answered in the forest canopy. And so I feel I was really fortunate on being on that frontier. In fact, it was called The Last Biotic Frontier by Terry Irwin of the Smithsonian, mm -hmm. who was discovering that you know, there were literally thousands of species of beetles in the forest canopy that, that never occurred on the forest floor. So this field of, of forest canopy research was something that I kind of got into literally on the ground floor, but have since tried to promote and literally elevate to the level that, that canopy researchers are just as significant as marine biologists who first you know took on the aqualung and scuba diving mm -hmm. and realized they could understand interactions that if they got to where they were looking and uh, and doing research and really understanding the organisms in their environment they could better understand what that subsystem either the the benthos of the of the ocean or the tops of forest trees 
what important roles they might play in the forest, the oceans as a whole. So you mentioned the beetles that are up there. Yeah. But there's, that's only one of a myriad of species that we didn't even know were there. Is that right, correct? Right, exactly. And, and you know, my interest is in um, the, the canopy plants that live up there, mm -hmm. that what are what we call epiphytes, epi meaning a pond, phyte meaning plants, plants that have evolved uh, through their life cycles, through evolution to live perched on branches and trunks of forest trees. They don't put their roots in the, in the trees. They don't have roots that go down to the soil, but they've evolved ways of gaining their water, their nutrients, uh, propagating their seeds and their next generation in this seemingly inimical world of the forest canopy where there's lots of sunlight, greater extremes of relative humidity and temperature, uh, this sort of spotty distribution of substrates that where they can actually colonize mm -hmm. up in the canopy. And to me that was just infinitely interesting and uh, and wonderful to be able to study. So where do you do this research? Um, I have two major research sites, um, which are interestingly, although they're very geographically distant, they're quite interestingly similar, uh, similar biologically. One of them is in Monteverde, Costa Rica, which is a tropical cloud forest in Costa Rica. There's a giant uh, Monteverde Cloud Forest Reserve, which protects the cloud forest there, where I have done most of my research. But I also work in the temperate rainforest of, the, of western Washington in the Olympic National Park. And there we have this very, very <coughs> small percentage of the Earth's surface is covered by what we call temperate rainforests. And the Olympic Peninsula, I don't know if you've ever been out mm -hmm. there, but it's a fantastic representative of, of these few places on Earth, you know, southern Chile, uh, southern Africa, uh, southern New Zealand, where the abundant rainfall and the moist, warm summer temperatures foster uh, very similar conditions in terms of moisture, fog and mist during the summer um, that, that we find in tropical rainforests. So what is a, a cloud forest? What, 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 what does well, that mean? that's a great question. A tropical cloud forest is something really distinct from what we think of as a lowland jungle. You know, that uh, tropical cloud forests are, occur in the mountains, mm -hmm. montane forests, um, and it's where the, the warm, moist air that comes off of tropical oceans hits mountains, moves up those mountain slopes, and because of the cooling that occurs with elevation, what we get are these wind-driven mist and fog clouds hmm. that literally blanket that kind of forest um, for much of the year, especially and most significantly during the dry season. Hmm. So even though if you put out a rain gauge in the middle of the dry season, which is like happening right now in February, January, February, uh, you wouldn't get any measurements. But because of this wind-driven mist and fog that comes from these clouds, um, the forest canopy is actually bathed in moisture, in nutrients that come that are coming in through rainfall and mist, and it really mitigates the harsh dry season that occurs in most tropical lowland forests. Hmm, fascinating. So, how do you um, you mentioned this in passing, but how do you get up there? What's the well, technique that, that you Well, that is the great question <laughs> of the year, and that is I have to say this very privately to you is one of the reasons. Why I do canopy research is because it's so much fun to get up there. Uh -huh. um, when I was starting out canopy research, I happened to encounter this um, canopy scientist who had adapted mountain climbing techniques to get up into the cloud, into the canopy. Um, he used a big crossbow to shoot his first oh, line up wow. there. Uh, when I was working in 1979, the Nicaraguan Sandinista Revolution was going on, and so moving from my graduate work in Seattle to Central America and having a crossbow in my luggage was not something that the, <laughs> the border officers wanted to see. And so I invented this thing called a master caster, which is just a slingshot mounted on a metal rod uh, with a fishing reel underneath. So I can shoot up a fishing line up and over a branch. That goes up and over the branch. I tie a nylon cord onto that. I reel that up. I then tie a climbing rope, just what you would buy at REI, up and over the branch. I tie one end onto that. I get into a harness. I use ascenders, which can move up the rope very easily. Mm -hmm. And boom, you've got access to not all of the tree, not the whole canopy itself, because you really can't get out to those outer limbs, uh, but you can get into the trunk area and the inner branches. Since that time, uh, canopy researchers have developed many other techniques that include hot air balloons, mm -hmm. that include construction cranes, uh, canopy walkways, and now, of course, we have technology that's helping us understand the canopy. So satellite imagery, mm -hmm. uh, remote sensing imagery, uh, what we call LIDAR, this, this sensing technique that allows us to map the contours of the outer canopy and the, and the ground itself so we can actually get images and measurements of the dimensions of the canopy itself. So I, in my mind, I think that 
canopy researchers have overcome the challenges that, that I used to face when thinking about how the hell do I get up there? <laughs> and that makes it very exciting for scientists because once you have access to something, then you can start asking and answering the interesting scientific questions. So you've, you've communicated very eloquently the kind of power for scientists of this work, but you're also very committed to and um, eloquent about the kind of affinities that human beings have with trees. And I know one of the things that you, one of the questions that you've confronted is, you know, what do people who never experience trees or rarely experience trees, what are they, what are they missing? And, and so say a little bit about your sense of what the affinities between trees and human beings are. Why, why is that connection such an important one for yeah, us? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And actually the word affinity that you use is so significant. It comes from the Latin word affinis, which means to be related by marriage. That is, I, sadly, am not a tree, <laughs> but I have a relationship with a tree as I do with my mother-in-law. I mean, she's not of my family, but she kind of is of my family. Mm -hmm. And so I think humans do have an affinity with trees. Part of it is as simple as the way we are structured. We have a crown. Trees have crowns. We have limbs. Trees have limbs. We have trunks. Trees have trunks. We have roots in where we live, and trees have roots. And so I think there's this sort of automatic physical affinity that humans have spoken or unspoken with trees. But I think that that affinity goes into almost every realm of sort of the way humans are and act and behave and what their values are. And we can start with a basic what do trees give me? Mm -hmm. And we can recount any number of ways that trees provide medicines. Well, for goodness sake, they provide oxygen. Mm -hmm. And if I choke myself for three minutes, you know, I re realize how important oxygen is to me. But it goes beyond that. It goes into social aspects. It goes into recreational aspects. Uh, you know, I don't care about sports at all. I mean, I really do not give a darn who wins the World Series. But when my friend told me that every bat mm of the American League and the National League is made of wood. I became deeply interested in sports <laughs> because they're all made of either ash trees or maple trees. And so there's a connection that sports people have with trees. But it goes beyond that in much deeper ways, of course, spiritual needs, mm -hmm. uh, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, the, the Jewish tradition of, of a Tub Shabbat, which celebrates the new year of the trees. And there's a special Seder that is, that is eaten with fruits and nuts of trees to celebrate the ways that trees provide gifts for human beings and this idea of providing funds to plant trees in Israel. So all of those things, I think, um, underline this, this deep, sometimes unspoken values that, that trees have for people. And I think what's really interesting, and I think environmental humanities has a lot to say about this, is the sort of almost therapeutic aspects that trees have for humans. This practice, Japanese practice of shinrin-yoku, mm -hmm. of tree showers, of tree bathing, of when you take a walk in some forest or even a little urban park that you might hear, have here in Eugene, there's a sense of calming, there's a sense of life is not so stressful as I might think it is. And I know in my lab, you know, when someone's having a hard time with the dissertation topic or something, you know, what we tell them is go take a Shinrin Yoku for goodness sake and then <laughs> calm yourself down. So those kinds of things I think are very, very basic. And when we help nature, when we connect with not just trees, I mean, I see trees as ambassadors to nature mm -hmm. because trees are so easy to, to connect with. I mean. I know when I give talks and I ask the audience, uh, you know, who here has a special tree in his or her life? Almost everybody says, oh yeah, there was a tree outside my window, there was a tree down the road, or you know, there's some special tree in someone's life that, that we can say, well, if that tree is special, then maybe this other tree is special, and maybe those trees on the hillsides are special, and maybe those trees in the Costa Rican rainforest that are being cut down are special. So I think that affinity, that connection of trees is is multi-layered, it crosses disciplines, it crosses societal bounds, it's, it's in every one of us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I love that. <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned the environmental humanities and you're, you're sounding to me very much like an environmental humanist right now. Um, your book, Between Earth and Sky, uh, aside from having many, uh, many stories about trees, and it's filled with poetry. Yeah. There's tons of poetry in there. Why was that important to you? Kali, that is a great question. And I, I have to say, I was scared to death of including those poems in that tree, in that book, because, um, 
you know, because scientists usually don't put poetry into mm. their books. And, you know, it was published by an academic press, mm -hmm. University of California Press, mm -hmm. which is this, you know, really highly regarded academic press. And so I wanted to make it a volume that was respected by my peers, my scientists. But, you know, I was a professor at the Evergreen State College for 20 years. This is a wonderful institution that is dedicated to the idea of the importance of interdisciplinary thinking and learning, much like your center, I think, um, encompasses the sciences and the arts and the humanities. And there was a particular professor, um, a poet named um, Craig Carlson, uh, who I was a good friend with, we interacted, we actually taught together, and he said, well, Nalini, I hope you're not just writing a, a typical science book about trees. You need to move your chair closer to the window mm -hmm. because the trees need a voice for people to understand how important that they are. And he said, poetry is good medicine. And I never forgot that. And I said, well, if Carl, if, if Craig thinks that poetry is good medicine, and if the world needs medicine in terms of its interactions with the environment, then maybe it's okay if I put poetry, and I myself love poetry. I mean, I was devastated by the death of Mary Oliver, as so mm -hmm. many of us have been, mm -hmm. um, and I've always been collecting po po you know, poets, poems about trees, and I felt that yes, adding poems into this book that is ostensibly kind of a, a science-y book would maybe strengthen the cause of understanding that there are many ways of understanding tree's importance to humans. There are many ways of communicating that, and one of them might be poetry in addition to the sciencey stuff that I put into it. So that's why I think poems were really important in this book, even though it was scary to put them in. <laughs> so you just mentioned um, the importance of communicating about science, not just to scientists. Yeah. And this, this is one of the other big areas of your career, is this uh, a variety of ways in which you reach other kinds of audiences to tell about science, to learn, to teach about trees. Um, one of the, there's a number of ways that you do this, but one, one that's particularly interesting, I think, or they're all very interesting, but this one's really sort of striking is you've done a lot of work bringing science to incarcerated populations. Tell us about that effort. Yeah, that effort, um, you know, I never predicted. I mean, my parents were middle class, People, they were immigrants, they believed in education, they gave us this wonderful upbringing. Uh, there was nobody who was incarcerated in my family that had, you know, I, I sort of related to that. But it always struck me that the incarcerated were, are, is a group of people in society, and actually a very huge group, you know, 2.2 .2 million incarcerated adults, one in 100 people are incarcerated, and, you know, seven times that in terms of people who are touched by our system of mass incarceration, it seemed like those people would suffer not only from loss of their jobs or their loss of their families, but their loss of connection to nature. And the thought of being cooped up in a concrete cell for five, six, seven years to me was is sort of an unbearable thought. Um, and I thought then as I worked through my thinking about how do I bring nature to, or the importance of nature to people it seems like the people who don't have contact with nature would most value it. I mean, you and I can go out and take a walk in the, in the foothills of the Cascades any time, but incarcerated people can't. And so bringing nature to them seemed like, well, they would probably really love it. And it turns out that they do. And so this idea of bringing conservation projects where uh, this first project that I did involved trying to solve an ecological question, which is, People are harvesting mosses from the old growth forests of the Pacific Northwest for the horticulture trade. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not sustainable. I know from my own research that it takes 30 or 40 years for mosses to grow back, so it's not sustainable. But if we could farm mosses, if we could grow mosses, that might relieve this harvesting pressure from old growth temperate forests of the Pacific Northwest. And I didn't have students at the time who could tackle this. I didn't have a greenhouse. I thought, well, maybe this is the opportunity mm -hmm. to bring in incarcerated people because they have time, they have space, and you know, growing mosses doesn't take sharp tools you know, to cultivate them. Mm -hmm. So I started knocking on prisons of, uh, doors of state prisons and saying, you know, could I enlist your inmates as partners in this endeavor? And there was this one prison in, um, in Washington State, the Cedar Creek Correction Center, and the superintendent was rather a forward-looking person, and he said, well, couldn't hurt, maybe it'll keep them occupied, 
bring on the mosses. So we did just that, and they got involved with this research project of which species grows fastest. They built these structures out, you know, these shelves out of recycled wood. Uh, we took the moss samples and dried them in the drying ovens at the Evergreen State College. And after 18 months, I had my scientific questions answered, which hmm. species grew fastest. The men loved having interactions with me and my graduate students. And the superintendent said, whoa, these guys are really interacting a lot better than they usually do. Hmm. And so that led to these this set of science lectures. I started bringing my fellow faculty into this prison to talk about their own research, their own conservation projects. And that led to them training these inmates to raise the Oregon spotted frog, 17 species of rare prairie plants, uh, the Taylor checker spot butterfly that began being supported by local conservation groups because it was the perfect storm. It was the perfect recipe of people who do not have contact with scientists, who do not have contact with nature, who maybe have had a terrible past history of science education in their own past. I flunked science. I did badly. I don't think of myself as a science learner. Well, if you present them with, an, with a lecture about trees that they can understand, it's like, oh, I understood everything that that professor said, so maybe I can shift my own self-identity from being science stupid mm. or science incapable mm -hmm. to s being a science learner. And I think that's one thing that's been really significant about this. But the other thing that's been really significant is about the shift in the scientists. Mm. The idea that when I have contact with a group that I think are stupid or dumb or bad in society, and I find that in, in contrast, they're, they're engaged, they're interested, they want to know more, and they have information and questions that they have gleaned from their own science-poor backgrounds that might have some insight to a scientist. It changes the scientist. It changes the way that academics think about other institutions in society. And so now I think really the significance of all of my 15 w years of work with bringing science and conservation to the incarcerated is, well, yes, that has had a really positive interaction with them. But what I think is far more interesting and important is what does it do to academia and academics mm -hmm. when we have connections to groups that we normally would never have. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to work on now, is, is understanding how, how contact with other groups of society can positively affect this bubble of people who think they're so darn smart, mm -hmm. and are so darn smart, but who are really isolated from so many things that are going on in society that truly need our attention, like mass incarceration, mm. uh, like the, the disconnect between nature and humans. How do we as scientists, what, how can we as scientists bridge that gap? What can we as, a sci as scientists do to make that gap narrow? Mm. Uh, what is our responsibility to do that? Do we just publish in our little journals, or do we just say, I'm gonna be brave enough to go into a correction center and give a talk to these tattooed guys and, and listen to what they might have to tell me. So you've also collaborated in a variety of ways with artists, poets, musicians. Say something about that aspect. Yeah, uh, you know, I've always been kind of jealous of artists and, <laughs> and poets and creative writers because of their amazing ability to, to communicate in ways that touch not only people's minds but also their hearts. And this is not to say that scientists can't do that, but it seems like, you know, amazing writers, amazing, <laughs> you know, English people like yourself and, and, and amazing artists can do that in a way that scientists really don't have access to. So why not set up collaborations between scientists and artists to see what might happen in terms of the potential for that, that those, those avenues of communication to widen? For instance, I don't think really, uh, you know, uh, someone who's really interested in modern dance and, and how modern dance works might not come to my scientific talk about forest canopy ecology. But if I collaborate with a dancer, a modern dancer, and communicate with her about the wonders, the diversity, the complexity, uh, the beauty of tropical rainforests, and what I know about the science, which actually makes it more interesting, more complex, uh, more, I don't know, more delicious, uh, <laughs> that dancer then might be able to communicate with dance audiences, not as a 
translator of science, but rather as a partner, an intellectual partner, in terms of understanding and communicating what is the essence, what is of importance to the, of that rainforest to that audience. And that's what I learned when I collaborated with a modern dancer, Jody Lomask, who is uh, the artistic director of the Capacitor Dance uh, Theater uh, in, in San Francisco. She called me up a, a number of years ago and said, Dr. Nadkarni, I know you study re rainforest. <laughs> I want to make a rainforest dance. Could you help me? And of course I said, yeah, <laughs> come on down to my research sites. And we spent 10 days there with her troupe. We climbed trees. We talked. We discussed. She created this amazing dance called Biome, which we performed in San Francisco and Seattle. And it was not like she was just taking what I knew and translating it into something that dance audience could understand or appreciate, it was that she was my partner in terms of understanding the forest. The questions she asked, the observations she made, were, were, were changed my realization that, that our artists are not just like botanical illustrators. They're partners and collaborators in understanding something as difficult and complex as a, as a tropical montane cloud forest. Hmm. And that was sheer pleasure, and that was sheer um, the best part of academics was this ability to make that sort of collaboration. And when we performed, what we did was I, I gave this 10 minute talk about the biology of the cloud forest, you know, with my slides and PowerPoints. Then she performed this amazing dance that inspired people. And then in the lobby, we had these tables of conservation groups who provided opportunities for the audience to actually take action in conservation. The Nature Conservancy was there, the Sierra Club was there, local tree planting groups were there. So that there was actually an application into real world conservation that happened as a result of this, this this colla truly collaboration, this co-laboring, this co-working between a scientist and an artist. And I, I see that as just what more scientists and more artists, hopefully, and more humanities people will get involved with as, as we progress into this mutual desire to help people get closer to nature. Great, um, amen to that. Um, I have a, we have a minute left, this okay. will be the last question. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been asked this, what's your favorite tree? The big leaf maple. <laughs> you want to say I why? know that right away. <laughs> big leaf maple, Acer macrophyllum, is by far the most fabulous tree. I mean, I'm biased because I love the Pacific Northwest, but those that huge trunk, those spreading branches, the invitation of those branches to mosses and and ferns and liverworts and lichens uh, that stand there not on the borders of these rivers of the Pacific Northwest but adjacent to them in these glades that are somewhat open but these majestic trees, um, you can't find a better tree than that. Well, on that note, I wanna thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's been a tremendous pleasure. Thanks. I've been speaking with Nalini Nankarni, professor of biology at the University of Utah. Nankarni gave a talk Tapestry Thinking, Weaving the Threads of Humans and Nature on January 30th, 2019, as the Oregon Humanities Center's Robert D. Clark Lecturer. Her talk was part of the Common Good series. Thanks so much for watching.